All right, hello everybody. My name is Ashley Peterson, and I'm up here on the stage with my colleagues Hunter Benkowski and Anna Markey. And our presentation is called The Puzzle of Science Building Ecological Understanding One Piece at a Time. And we were a little puzzled why our uh, presentations and projects were put together, but um, we have a great presentation for you and we figured it out. So can anyone tell me what this is? Go ahead, just shout it out. Anyone know? Probably not. Um, if you zoom out a little bit, you can see that it's a bee, in fact. Yeah, so uh, this one might be a little easier. People, what do we got here? Yeah, soil. Come on, there we go. Okay, how about this? Nothing? Okay. Um, here we go, zoomed out. Some cute little deer. So basically our projects are all small pieces of much larger ecological projects and the things that are going on and we're just a little piece of that, but each little piece is needed to make a giant picture. So for my project, I was working out in West Virginia, a little town called Williamstown on the border of Ohio. Um, and I was catching bees, specifically comparing bees visiting gardens versus nearby natural areas. Um, and thinking about how my little piece of research fits into the larger ecological puzzle of bee research and pollinator understanding. Um, I found that a lot of urban bee research was done in really big cities like New York and San Francisco. Um, and I wasn't really able to find much research that was done in small towns. And this was surprising to me because despite having low human populations, small towns actually take up a lot of physical area and lots of space and potentially can be really valuable habitat for bees. So that's how my piece fits into the larger puzzle. So I did most of my project in conjunction with a really large project that the US Department of Energy is doing all looking at watershed characteristics, as in what and how do they respond to different disturbances and stressors. So my piece of that puzzle is really small, but the big piece is a big watershed function. Okay, last audience participation, but has anyone hit an animal while they were driving? All right, yeah, quite a few people. So my project uh, involves trying to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. And so I looked at a specific ungulate migration corridor on the Cold Harbor Institute property that crosses Highway 50. And by utilizing trail cameras, I was able to narrow down an area where uh, mule deer and elk are more likely to cross the highway. And this information will hopefully inform future management and infrastructure decisions, such as a wildlife overpass or underpass. And having this information is just one more piece of the puzzle to understanding ungulate migration and how to mitigate wildlife vehicle collisions. So if there's anything you take away as we're going into our presentations individually here, it's that science and ecological research particularly is really complex. It's highly interconnected, just like puzzle pieces. Um, and often it's built piece by piece until we have a larger picture so we can see what's going on. So with that, I'm actually going to get us started off um, by talking about my project. Okay, so for anyone that missed it, my name is Hunter Benkoski and I was in the MS program. Um, and the full official long title of my project is Evaluating Differences in Bee Visitation in Small Urban Gardens in Nearby Natural Areas in Williamstown, West Virginia. So we're just gonna hop straight into my methods. So I was out catching bees for about five months in 2021 from the end of March until about the beginning of September. 
Um, and I had eight sites, each of which I visited every single week. Um, and those were four gardens and four natural areas. Um, and so for every single site visit, there were essentially two main things happening. There was flower stuff and bee stuff. So starting with the flowers at all of my sites, they're about 100 square meters. I identified every single flowering species that was blooming in the site at the time that I visited. Um, and I also did a rough abundance count just by looking at the percentage of the area that was covered in flowering plants. Uh, then I took some weather data, just temperature, cloud cover, wind speed, to make sure that I had appropriate conditions for catching my bees. Um, and then for the bee catching itself, I did something called a variable transect walk method, um, which was essentially I wandered around my sites and every time I saw a bee on a flower, I netted it. Um, and then from there, for my smaller bees, such as shown here in the vial, that's a small black solitary bee, I identified it into a functional group, such as that, or for example, the bumblebee species. Those smaller bees got put in vials and then just stuck in a cooler so I wasn't recapturing them as I was sampling. And then the larger bees, such as the bumblebees on the right, uh, they got dots of paint so I wasn't recapturing them. And those are actually two different bumblebee species on those flowers right there. Um, so as you can see, sometimes the ID is uh, very in the details to figure out what's what. So some general results. First of all, I visited my sites a total of 126 times. Um, and that was between 14 and 17 visits per site, and then exactly 63 visits per site type, so 63 gardens, 63 natural area. And over my course of five months, I got 2,504 bees. Um, so I was busy, very, very busy. Um, so I mostly was catching bumblebees. There were three main species that were kind of the most common. Um, I also caught a lot of those small black solitary bees and then plenty of honeybees. And I had some other groups as well, such as I called them green bees, they're shiny and green. I had large black solitary bees, which were bigger than the small ones, as you can imagine. Um, there are also some carpenter bees around as well. Um, so just generally looking over my flowers, I caught 107 off of the flowers, I should say. There were 107 different flowering species in the gardens, and then 34 species in the natural areas. Um, there were a few more than that that I wasn't catching the bees on, but those are the ones that I actually caught them on at the two site types. So obviously there were a lot more uh, flowers that the bees were visiting in the gardens. So we're just kind of going to go through each of my four main questions and the results that I found from that. So the first big question is just if the abundance of my bees was different at the gardens versus the natural areas. Uh, so on the right here, we have a box plot, really simple. Um, so we have the garden sites and the natural sites. Now on the y-axis there, we have our catch rate of the number of bees I caught per minute. Um, so this is my proxy for abundance because sometimes I wasn't always visiting for the same amount of time. Um, so the answer to this question is yes, there was a difference. I got more bees in the gardens and the natural areas by a very significant margin. Um, so if we break that down by our functional groups, chart on the right's a little overwhelming, the work on the left side, there were significantly more of these small black solitary bees, honeybees, and two of my bumblebee species in the gardens, but there wasn't a significant difference for the large black solitary bees, the carpenter bees, the green bees, and one of my bumblebees. And I should say for the large black solitary bees, the carpenter and the green bees, uh, this was likely due to sample size um, because, for example, I only caught those carpenter bees in the gardens, but because there were only, you know, 20 or 30 of them uh, that didn't show up in the statistics. So question number two is if the floral abundance was the strongest indicator of that bee visitation compared to site type or surrounding area or the floral species composition. So once again, looking at our box plot here, we have our gardens and natural areas. On the y-axis this time, we just have the floral abundance. Um, so there were also significantly more flowers at my garden than my natural areas. Um, and then our little uh, box on the bottom there is just showing that floral abundance was the strongest indicator of that bee abundance. Stronger than floral species richness or the site type or the combination of both abundance and floral species richness. So question number three is if that floral visitation by the bees varied over time between the gardens and natural areas. Um, so to acquaint you with this chart here on the x-axis, we have our time of the year. And then y-axis, we have that bee catch rate again. So you can notice for the darker is the gardens and the lighter the natural, there's a pretty similar pattern happening here where we have kind of a little peak one and then a big peak two of that bee visitation. Um, but you can notice that the gardens are delayed from the natural areas by about a couple of weeks for both of those peaks. So in the natural areas, it was early April was kind of our first wave of visitation. And then early July was a big wave compared with the gardens where it was early May and then late July. 
So if we look at our floral abundance over time related to that, um, so once again, the gardens are the darker and the natural areas are the lighter over time and then floral abundance is on the y-axis this time. So you can see uh, on the left side for the gardens that there's kind of a, a few outliers hanging out right over here. Um, that was because one of my gardens had a forsythia bush, which for anyone who's not familiar, they're really common in the Midwest and the Northeast especially. Um, it was just a huge bush that took up a lot of site and was blooming like crazy. So that's why there's a little bit more abundance there. Um, but the garden abundance generally follows that peak in late July, um, which lines up really nicely when we saw the most bees. Um, if we compare that to the natural areas, however, we have spring beauty in the early spring, which brings up that abundance a little bit, but the floral abundance was actually pretty constant throughout the season. So that suggested to me that our bee abundance in the natural areas is maybe more driven by those key floral relationships. So the spring beauty early on, and then later in the season, we had Asclepias tuberosa, which is butterfly weed. Um, it's orange, also very common in the Midwest and Northeast. Um, and then later in the summer, we had Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, which is narrow leaf mountain mint. So fourth question, and I think the most interesting is if the plant pollinator relationships vary between the gardens and natural areas. So everybody take a deep breath. We're about to look at a network plot and they can be a little bit overwhelming, but I'm gonna walk you through it, okay? So this is our first network plot. Yeah, yeah, it's a little crazy. So what's happening here is on the bottom, we have our different bee groups. So for example, in the bottom right, we have SBSB, small black solitary bees. And then on the top, we have all of the different plants. So this is the network plot for the natural area. So there's 37 different plant species hanging out at the top there. Um, and then those lines that are connecting them is just the abundance of the bees visiting a given plant. So this is what it looks like for the gardens. A little bit more crazy, but the same thing happening here where we have a lot more plants that the bees are visiting on the top. Uh, so we have a lot more interconnections. So we're just gonna look at some of the, the key similarities and differences between these rather than stare at them for a while because they're a lot. Um, so first of all, at both site types, the small black solitary bees had their own set of preferences in terms of the flowers that they were visiting. Um, specifically, they had a bunch of flowers they visited that I didn't catch anything else on. Um, also, they were visiting the greatest diversity of flowers compared to all the other bee functional groups and species. Also, our bumblebees each had distinct preferences in terms of what types of flowers they liked to visit, particularly Bombus griseocolis, which is the brown belted bumblebee. Um, it's a short tongued bee and it's more of a specialist. Um, so it had really distinct, like it liked milkweeds. That's what it liked to stick on and it didn't visit much else. Um, and there were also some interesting genus preferences in terms of what flowers the bees like to visit at the two site types. So for example, we had that Asclepias, which in the natural areas, it was common milkweed. But then in the gardens, there was a swamp milkweed that that brown belted bumblebee really liked. Um, and then there was also Pycnanthemum, which in the natural areas I mentioned earlier was Pycnanthemum tenuifolium, which is narrow leaf mountain mint. But in my garden, somebody had Pycnanthemum, oh boy, I can't think of the, the scientific name for now, but it's Hori mountain mint, it's related. Um, so some key differences, for one thing, I only caught those carpenter bees at the gardens. I did see them around in the natural areas, but I didn't catch any, so there were definitely fewer of them. Um, and also there is more overlap in the bumblebee preferences at the gardens, which is interesting. Uh, the two other bumblebee species that were present, the common eastern bumblebee and the two-spotted bumblebee, uh, they visited a greater diversity of flowers in the gardens than they did in the natural areas. Um, and just generally, all of my different functional groups and species had wider preferences in terms of what they were visiting in the gardens, likely because there was just a greater diversity of stuff available that they were willing to visit. So some community impacts and management implications. On the right here, we have some infographic. This is just uh, some pieces cut out. Oh, there it is. Pycnanthemum incanum. That's the scientific name for the other mountain mint. Um, so this is an infographic that I created that I'm going to be distributing to the homeowners I worked with, as well as kind of the local community via Facebook groups um, and through uh, Williamstown B City USA committee. Um, the idea was I wanted to make something that was accessible and understandable that took all of this crazy scientific information and went, okay, here's the stuff that the bees liked. Here's what you can plant in your gardens and here's what they like in other places. Um, so one interesting thing that happened that I noticed is in the early spring, there was that spring beauty in the natural areas. In the gardens, the spring beauty wasn't really around much, but there were a lot of weeds in people's gardens in the early spring. 
things like dandelion and this ground ivy. And the ground ivy is actually an invasive species, so I don't really recommend keeping that one around in particular. But I found that with the spring beauties not present in the gardens, those weeds actually played a really important early spring role when not much else was blooming. So in terms of the implications for homeowners, there's kind of two options. First is getting some spring beauty and putting that in. Um, the second is just leaving some of those weeds around the margins of flower beds, particularly in that early spring um, time period where there isn't much else and the bees are looking for something to eat. Um, and then of course I provided a list of other species that the bees like to visit that people can put in their gardens. Um, and that community aspect and that community, uh, communication is something that was really important to me going into this project. Um, so this was a really important kind of takeaway for me as well as something to give back to the community that was so gracious in sharing their space with me. So this is a photo of ironweed. Um, this was my favorite plant out of the summer. I grew to really appreciate all the different plant species that I was visiting and getting to know a little bit better. Um, and with that, I would just like to take some time to thank the people that made this project possible and that helped me along the way. So first of all, to my advisor, Dr. Robin Bingham, as well as to my community, or excuse me, my committee members, Dr. Tori Reynolds and Dr. Jenny Reifel. They were really paramount in helping me get this all together, both in terms of study design, making sure I was staying on track with the timing of things, making adjustments that I needed to go, editing, statistics, all of it. Um, I really could not have done this without their help. So thank you all so, so much. Also to Williamstown B City USA Committee, um, as well as all of the homeowners that allowed me to visit uh, in their gardens that were so gracious in sharing their spaces with me. Thank you so much. I literally could not have done this without you. Um, to my two research assistants, uh, kind of impromptu, my mom and my partner ended up being, uh, you know, coming along out with me on these hot days. Um, and it wasn't easy field work. I mean, I was doing it for a long time and it was hot, humid, there were ticks, chiggers. I mean, we got into everything. Um, and they were so, so gracious in helping me write down data and carrying all the research supplies um, and they made my work so much easier. So thank you both so much uh, for all of your support and thank you all for being here. So at that time, I'll say thank you all and open up for questions. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. So the question was, what comes next? Um, yeah, so this was kind of an informational study, if you will, and I had a little bit of that community impact in terms of giving, um, you know, recommendations to what they can put in. I would love to, in the future, do some more hands-on um, and some more of the implementation of, okay, we have the understanding now, let's put in some community gardens, let's spread this information on a larger scale. Um, as I mentioned, it felt like this is a small piece in a larger puzzle. I kind of want to take this and expand it out from here. Anna, yeah. Yeah, so the question was about my methodology with putting some bees in the cooler and some painted, um, yeah, and why I made that choice. So part of it was just something of size. Painting the larger bees is easier. Um, I've done it for a couple summers. I was looking at it rumble, and so I'm, you know, I've gotten pretty quick with the paint pen of um, dotting them and letting them go so I don't recapture them. Um, with the small bees, they're just too small to put that paint on. Um, so they got put into the cooler and I should say the cooler temperature was actually not that cold. It was really just to prevent them from overheating because there were a lot of days where it was over 90 degrees. Um, so yeah, so they were just in there for the duration of while I was out catching stuff and then they were immediately released afterwards. So the assumption was that week to week, I wasn't recapturing those small bees because they're generally not out for a very long period of time.
yeah, so a lot built into that. I'll try to synopsize, you know, that's great. I'm glad that you're passionate about it, me too. Um, so the question was about um, in the natural areas, what we can do to improve management to make them more bee friendly, um, as well as kind of the phenological role of gardens and how they interact with that. So um, there's a whole host of management recommendations that I can send you some information um, about management in natural areas. For example, different burning practices. If an area is being burned rather than burning the entire thing, um, doing it in smaller patches, that way you leave a mosaic behind. So overwintering bumblebee nests, for example, or anything that's in the ground isn't getting rooted out all at once. So we have some um, resilience left in that community. Um, so there's lots of management implications like that. I would say another thing I noticed, some of my natural area sites were more bee friendly than others. So for example, I had one site that had um, not many bees throughout. And part of that was because the grasses were so thick that a lot of those lower lying flowers early on just didn't really have the space or the sunlight to grow. Um, so definitely like leaving some more sunlight, space for sunlight to come in, right? Um, and less competition with other dense ve vegetation, um, I think would be another important management implication as well. In terms of the role of gardens, it's interesting because I was like, oh, I caught more bees in the gardens. There's more flowers, that's great, right? That doesn't mean we should take out all the natural areas and just have planted gardens everywhere. Um, in reality, I think gardens, particularly for bumblebees, there were tons of bumblebees visiting and that might just be a function of bumblebees can travel farther. So they can go where maybe there's not a lot of nesting opportunity in those gardens. They can travel from wherever they're nesting nearby and come visit and take all of those really high uh, pollen and um, yeah, pollen dense flowers um, for food and then head back home. So I think one of the ways we could improve the gardens as well is looking more at improving nesting availability for those ground nesters and cavity nesters. Um, so those smaller bees that don't travel as far have the opportunity to kind of hang out in those areas as well, as well as have kind of a buffer when maybe the natural areas aren't providing as much food. We have one question online from William Lee. He's asking, which of the species did you studied are you the most concerned about and which seems to be surviving the best? Thanks for your question, William. It's good to hear from you. Hi. Um, so, oh gosh, that's hard. I think I'd say the one that I was probably the most concerned about is that brown belted bumblebee, the Bombus griseocolis. Um, so generally there's a pattern in urban areas that um, generalist species do better because they don't have necessarily the things that they're specialized to love right there. Um, and so uh, if you remember, there wasn't a significant difference. There weren't significantly more of those brown belted bumblebees in the garden than the natural areas. And particularly, there was only one garden site that had that swamp milkweed that the brown belted really liked. So if that wasn't there, um, I probably would have had fewer of them in the gardens than the natural areas. Um, so I'd say generally any kind of specialist bee that has a more narrow range of what it eats um, would be what I'm most concerned about in the sense of what people are planting in their gardens, unless you're thinking about having that diversity of flowers and choosing things for those specialists, it's really easy for them to get left out um, of the equation. In terms of what I'm uh, least concerned about, probably the common eastern bumblebee, the brown belted, um, they were all over the place everywhere in the gardens and the natural areas, um, as well as, you know, the managed honeybees. Honeybees are actually from Europe. They're not native to North America, which a lot of people don't know. Um, so I'm definitely not concerned about their status in terms of just hanging out in uh, natural areas versus gardens. Great, thank you so much. That's all the time we have now for individual questions. Okay, great, I'll yeah. hand it off to Ashley. Thank you so much. All right, hello everybody. I'm Ashley Peterson. If you didn't know, our project is communicating the science of alpine ecosystem processes. And although this is my project, I have a lot of help from my community sponsor, Dr. Heidi Seltzer, as well as my data and field, field team, Amanda and Chelsea, the writer of the book Wild at Heart, which we'll get to later, and my faculty mentor, Micah Russell. So my project kind of takes on two chapters. I'm really interested in science, but also in the way that science is communicated and in trying to make that communication 
uh, more applicable to everyday people. Um, so my first chapter has to do with me up at Rumble last summer. Uh, it's an ecological project I was working on. My deliverables for my team include R code and some data sets. In my non-technical communication, I taught an undergrad class, some field methods, which is really cool. And then I'll also talk about a book called Wild at Heart that I was working on editing and revising. All right, so like I said earlier, I started doing this project with Heidi Stelzer and it's in conjunction with the US Department of Energy. And they also have a ton of other collaborators like the Berkeley Lab and a whole bunch of people. I kind of went at this project for my master's a little bit differently. Instead of starting with a project I was interested in doing, I found somebody that I was really interested in working with. So I sought out Heidi and from that connection, we were able to create a project. So we looked at um, snow melt timing mostly and soil water content were big things that I was interested in as they're looking at the whole watershed. Um, the East River watershed, we call our site the pump house as you can see on that red dot there. You can see it a little better here. Um, there's one. Okay. So there's the site, Mount CB here town of Crested Butte is here. If you don't know, that's just like 30 minutes north up the road. Uh, some of my questions were, how does the timing of snowmelt affect water availability throughout the season? And how does slope aspect and position affect soil water content? All right, so I have a lot of methods and I could probably spend my entire time talking about this slide alone. So I'm going to briefly talk about some of the things that we did in the field last summer. Um, we did some collections of different vegetation that we then sent off to Berkeley Lab for further analysis. We looked at transects and did vegetation cover and height. We looked at leaf mass area, which is just an indication of health for the plant. Um, water holding capacity, as you can see in this middle picture, we would dehydrate and rehydrate leaves and calculate the difference in mass to see how much water they were capable of holding. We looked at normalized difference vegetation index, which is NDVI. And that data came from the satellite Sentinel-2. I also figured out snow melt date on a plot level using soil temperature and R. OK, so let's go through a couple figures. Um, OK, so this is soil water content. Red is going to be north facing slopes and blue south facing slopes. So kind of just like on a hill slope, we're going to have up here is the higher slope and then you go down to the toe slope. So just like on a mountain, on a hill, it's the same aspect. Um, so for soil water content, a few things are interesting to note. Of course, I mean, pretty expected that typically north facing slopes are going to have more water available to vegetation. Um, with more water being in the soil. And especially in the growing season, it's interesting to look at because at, towards the end of the growing season, you have way more water available in the toe slope versus up here in the hill slope. On this graph, it's going to be the same hill slope, toe slope, and the colors being the same thing, north facing and south facing. But this is growing degree day, which is an interesting calculation. You can look more into it. I don't have a time to fully explain the details, but um, basically this is showing when these plots are melting out and 
So here, like we have the south facing slopes are melting out sooner, earlier in April, and then the north facing slopes are melting out later. And the, with the growing degree day, it's an accumulation of days that they are that the conditions are good enough and are adequate for growth to occur. So north facing slopes are able to accrue a lot more growing degree days by melting out later than the south facing slopes are able to do by melting out a lot sooner. Um, like we were talking about, this is a small piece of a much larger project that the US Department of Energy is doing. And more time is obviously needed. It's pretty hard to draw any conclusions based on a one year study. Water is life, watersheds are really important. So understanding the dynamics and what goes into the functionality of the greater watershed, what stressors affect it is really important. And that's what they're working on. So yeah, research from this project is helpful for um, everywhere. It's indicative of high mountain regions across the globe. Of course, there's gonna be some differences, but it is very indicative of what's going on. Um, and the continuation of the project, of course, this project's gonna continue and they'll be able to use some of my code that I was able to create over the course of this project for further years. Um, our second chapter, this is Pike's Peak in December, by the way. Go, oh, it's really pretty. Um, I guest lectured one of Micah Russell's undergraduate classes. I taught them about transects, and we also looked at vegetation cover and height. So that was a glorious fall day. Um, there's this book, Wild at Heart. It's a field guide to plants, birds, mammals, um, specifically in the Snowmass Aspen area. But Janice Huggins, the author of this book, she published it like 10 or 11 years ago and has been continuously asked to expand the book to include all of Colorado high country. And the last year she decided she wanted to do that. So um, she, and she wanted help. So I helped her with this and it's still currently happening. So I, we're working on editing, revising and updating. The book is not super outdated, but a little bit. There's definitely revisions and we've been adding a bunch of plant species as well. So I'm really happy that I got to work on this project. It's been pretty cool to be a part of such a big project um, and really interesting to be just a little piece of that too, because there's so much going on and I was able to learn a lot of different methods and as well as the book, because I was definitely hoping that I would find some way to communicate science in a way that was more easily um, accessible. And Wild at Heart ended up being the perfect avenue for that. Um, and hopefully that book will be on sale later this year. So that's pretty cool. I want to... I, say thank you to my mentor, Micah Russell, especially. Um, yeah, I know many people have said, yeah, I was like crying on Zoom to Micah several times. Thank you so much. Um, my community sponsor, Dr. Heidi Stelter, as well as my team has been really helpful. Amanda with R has been incredible. Um, and my funding sources, I received funding from Rumble, the Gupta Fellowship, and the Haley Fund. And that's it. Emily.
Yeah, so to repeat the question, please. Sure, sure. Emily said she follows me on social media <laughs> and she wants to. Even my social media. And um, I would say, well, I originally moved to Colorado to study alpine ecology. So that mountains are my my everything, right? So that's why I'm hiking peaks constantly. And that's why I'm out there all the time and why I wanted to study this because it's so interesting to see since climate change is happening much quicker, you can see the effects a lot quicker in mountain areas, mountain regions. It's really interesting to be around it and see it firsthand. So um, I also took the creative nonfiction writing course and that definitely helped with our communication as well. We have a question online from Dr. Micah Russell says, nice work, Ashley. You showed a lot of initiative in seeking out both technical and non-technical projects and partners. Which of these or both will be a priority for you going forward? Thanks, Micah. <laughs> yeah. um, wow, that's difficult. Uh, I would probably say both. I'm still very interested in both, but I am leaning towards, I mean, I really like the communication piece. And I found that in my undergrad as well. Like, it's really hard to, there's so much good science happening and technical science that it's not being translated super well to the general public who just doesn't know about it. So I think the communication and writing portion is probably what I'll pursue. Yeah, for sure. Um, it definitely is, but they're like just starting to kind of think about that because we really need to figure out what is going on and what happens when these systems are put under stress. Um, so I think it's going to be pretty difficult, too, because getting people to want to change and even if you're like, hey, this is for the good of the watershed, they're going to be like, okay. So I think that it's going to be pretty difficult to make some of those decisions going forward. But I mean, eventually, though, it's going to happen. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time we have for individual questions. So we'll move on to the next presentation. Anna Markey. Good job. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Anna Markey, and my project involved monitoring ungulate migration across Highway 50 which is the main highway in and out of Gunnison. And I know they mentioned not to put in a lot of maps, but I have a lot of maps, so I apologize. <laughs> so the aim of this project was to find ways to reduce wildlife vehicle collisions. And a wildlife vehicle collision is when an animal has been struck by a motor vehicle and is usually killed or fatally injured. Uh, in the United States, one to two million crashes with wildlife are reported each year. And these collisions can result in an average of 200 human deaths and 26,000 injuries. And it can cause uh, an average of $8 billion in property damages. And so in Colorado, an average of 3,300 collisions are reported each year. And there are definitely more wildlife vehicle collisions that aren't reported. Uh, for instance, I was involved in my first wildlife vehicle collision on April 19th in the morning and I did not report it since I hit the deer. Uh, my vehicle, thankfully I was in a work truck, it was not damaged and the deer actually ran off and lived to tell the tale and hopefully she's still alive telling that tale. 
Um, but yeah, which brings me to my next point that most collisions occur at dawn and dusk when animals are most active. And there's also an increased risk when you're to be involved in a collision in migrational periods, such as in the spring and summer and fall winter. So my study area was the property boundaries of the Cold Harbor Institute Ranch that borders the US Highway 50. And the ranch is located seven miles east of town and it consists of 334 total acres and 243 of these acres are under a conservation easement. And I did not know what a conservation easement was until I started working with Cold Harbor. And essentially they are voluntary legal agreements that permanently limit the use of the land in order to protect the conservation value. So this property provides ideal habitat and forage for ungulates and the Tamitri Creek winds through it providing a consistent water source. And it will continue to provide this ideal habitat for ungulates under this conservation easement. And in 2019, a wildlife corridor was defined on the property and is considered one of the top 10 wildlife migration corridors for mule deer and elk. And you can kind of see that on the right side or on the east side of the property. And unfortunately, this migration corridor has to cross the main highway in and out of town. And there are increased collisions along this stretch of highway with wildlife. We have a general idea of where this corridor is, but we wanna know more about where deer and elk are more likely to cross. And so in order to try and solve this problem, I set up 24 trail cameras to capture images of deer and elk along the fence lines of the Cold Harbor property. 11 of them were on the north side of the highway represented by these blue points, and 13 were on the south side of the highway represented by the purple points. And each camera was placed roughly 120 to 150 meters apart to avoid capturing the same ungulate on different cameras at the same time. And the ones north of the highway definitely look closer, at least on this map, but that's mainly due to the spacing on top of ridges, on top of ridges and in the drainages. So these cameras have been out since May 8th of 2021. And they're still out now, but for this presentation, I've stopped the data collection through March of 2022. In total, I've looked through and tagged almost 12,000 trail camera photos in the Colorado Parks and Wildlife photo database. And from this photo tagging software, I was able to take each individual species and the total individuals of those species for each migration season. And so those numbers are shown here for deer and elk during the spring, summer, and fall winter seasons. Uh, the fall winter season had higher elk uh, numbers, especially on the east end of the property. And there are high numbers of mule deer during both seasons. And they seem to congregate more in the middle of the property, which I found to be interesting. So they're just hanging out kind of in the middle. And so just to show you kind of what I was looking at, uh, here are some deer captured on camera 10, and so I'd have to count each individual deer within each photo. And then here are some elk captured on camera one. Then I decided to look at all ungulate totals for both seasons, and the center of the property is turning more into an area of heavy activity along with the east end of the property. And for the middle, this is most likely due to much higher deer numbers in the middle of the property in general. And so these higher deer numbers in the middle of the property could be due to the fact that there is a culvert located on the southern end of the property. And I've actually captured some deer using this culvert, uh, but others may be a little bit too wary of it. So for an, in order for like an underpass or kind of a culvert to be comfortable for wildlife to use it, it's recommended to be 40 feet long and 15 feet tall. And so it's pretty neat that some deer are still using this culvert on the property, even though it's roughly like six and a half feet tall and six and a half feet wide. And I even captured a bear using it, which I thought was pretty cool. <laughs> and so to further look into potential ungulate migration paths, I made a habitat suitability index in GIS, and I took into account proximity to roads, human development, elevation, ruggedness of terrain, and presence of herbaceous uh, vegetation. So all in all, Gunnison County is great habitat for ungulates. And then I was able to use this habitat 
Ungulate uh, Suitability Index to then create a migration corridor model. That one's over here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. And I chose two pieces of public land that border Highway 50 in the area that Cold Harbor Ranch resides. And then through GIS, it created a line for me for a corridor that represents the path of least resistance between the two pieces of public land. So this means it's generally the easiest and most effective route for an ungulate to go from one patch of land to the other. And this path also happens to go through the east end of the Cold Harbor property. Uh, the property was not included in the modeling process. It was just a layer in GIS that I put in after the corridor model ran. So I thought it was really cool that it actually went right through that east end of the property. I also did a little side project with Survey123 in ArcGIS where I made my own survey and documented roadkill along the major roadways in Gunnison just by driving up and down them looking for dead deer and elk. And for reference, the blue lines are deer migration paths and the green lines are elk migration paths in the county. And so then the blue dots are deer roadkill and green dots are elk roadkill. And I was able to take this information and create a heat map of roadkill in the valley. And Cold Harbor is this hot spot right here. And I definitely saw more, uh, definitely more mule deer roadkill on the east end of the property. I was also able to capture some fun photos of deer and elk jumping the fence onto the Cold Harbor property. And from this, we can tell where the deer and elk are definitely crossing the highway in order to get onto the property. And I even had a bull elk partially take down one of my cameras but it allowed me to get this cool photo of a potentially different elk contemplating jumping the fence. So with a combination of this migration corridor model, the migration routes provided by GPS collar data from Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the trail camera data, there's definitely a migration corridor on the east end of this property. Uh, this would be an area to focus on for a potential wildlife overpass or underpass. And even if the existing culvert could be expanded, that could also be an option for the deer in the middle of the property. And it would be interesting to put up trail cameras on public lands across from the east end of the property. So kind of like right in here, it would be interesting to see kind of what ungulate activity is happening over there. And I would also think it'd be interesting to expand on the roadkill survey in order to really hone in on some wildlife vehicle hotspots. And so I was able to isolate other migration routes that cross major highways in the county. And I think this project could be improved upon and used as sort of a baseline to look for other potential high risk areas, especially with talk of expanding Highway 50 into a four lane highway. And it'll be harder and a greater risk for wildlife to cross four lanes of traffic. It'll definitely be interesting to see when the new housing development called Gunnison Rising is built right to the east of campus and town. Uh, more motorists will then be moving along the highway and this development will be right where these two other elk migration routes are located that cross the highway. This project also has implications for wildlife management. Uh, last year, there were close to 4,500 wildlife vehicle collisions reported for the state of the Colorado and these were just collisions involving deer. Uh, most revenue from conservation comes from hunting tags and licenses, which I'm sure most of you know, and fewer wildlife vehicle collisions could mean more tags sold, more deer sustainably harvested and feeding families, and more revenue for the state. And more revenue would then mean more funds for conservation and wildlife projects. There is some good news though. The Colorado Senate is considering a bill that would provide $20 million for 25 projects such as wildlife overpasses and underpasses. Several, several of these projects are already planned for the Western Slope. A lot of what the bill cites for the need of these projects comes from an eco-resolution study that looked at the impact of overpasses, underpasses, and wildlife fencing on wildlife vehicle collisions. This study found that these kinds of infrastructure led to 92% reduction in accidents and 90% reduction in animal deaths. Hopefully this bill passes and Highway 50 is seriously considered for at least one of these projects. And I know where they can put one. <laughs> I would like to thank MJ and the Cold Harbor Institute for supporting this project. 
and letting me use their property as well as several of their trail cameras. I'd also like to thank Ralph Butch Clark for funding my fellowship and the fellowship of others in perpetuity. To Margie and John Haley for their gift of the Haley Grant, which funded my project. The Center for Public Lands for the use of their trail cameras. Colorado Parks and Wildlife for guidance and migration data and the faculty and staff at Western who provided guidance and helped me develop new skills, especially my mentor, Sally Thode. Any references? Any questions? Yes. Absolutely. So the question is, um, there can be a lot of barriers building uh, big projects such as overpasses or underpasses. So if I come across anything such as like blinking lights or simpler solutions to help mitigate wildlife vehicle collisions. And there are definitely uh, some things that we can do, like you'll see on the highway, there's even a sign near the kind of the Cold Harbor Institute that has a deer. So you'll see deer, elk signs trying to warn people that, yes, they're moving along in this area. They have done motion sensor lights in some places where it kind of goes off if an animal is there, which is really interesting. Um, I did talk to someone in the Colorado Department of Transportation when I was like, hi, like, what if we put a sign out here? What if we warn more people? And he was hesitant to kind of help me out with doing that because it can kind of get lost in the background where people are just like, oh, there's just tons of signs. I don't really pay attention or look at them. And then stuff with like blinking lights and motion sensors. I think it's a great idea, but then you also have to maintain the landscaping around them. Cause what if there's just a tree branch or a piece of grass waving in the wind that's constantly setting off this motion sensing light. People realize that, that there's no animal around and they're just like, no, nah, whatever. Like it's not there and then get into a collision. Yes. That's a great question. Thank you. It was uh, how I mentioned that Highway 50 might be expanded into a four lane highway. At least there's talk about it. And if a project such as an overpass or underpass could be planned in into that expansion. And I hope that they do take that into consideration. I do know that sometimes uh, a wildlife underpass or overpass can cost from $300,000 to a million dollars. And that's why the Senate bill is $25 million just for 25 projects because they're kind of allocating about a million dollars per project. Um, I would hope they would take that into consideration. Uh, I think there is an issue. So on the east end of the property, there's Highway 114. And so there's kind of different, like Colorado Department of Transportation has different offices that work kind of on different sections of the highway. And there's kind of two offices that meet at that intersection. So then they would have to communicate with each other and figure out what they want to do after with this expansion and building a project like that. Yes, Nina. <laughs> A 
That's a great question. So if and when, the question was if and when the Senate bill passes, how will they decide where these projects are going? And that's really great. I haven't read the entire bill. I would hope that they would look into places that keep reporting high records of wildlife vehicle collisions. I think it was in 2016, the Gunnison Basin had a huge snow year. So that pushed a bunch of deer and elk more closer to town and onto these roads because they couldn't get over snowpack. And I think someone was saying they had like nine deer collisions in an hour just on this one stretch of highway. So I'd hope they'd look into kind of past records of wildlife vehicle collisions. I would love to get CDOT this information and tell them kind of where there's different hotspot areas. And then hopefully they would take into this information into account to decide where to put these projects. Yes. That's a great question. So the question is, um, it's obvious that there's a migration corridor here, but how much more information would need to be provided for a project such as a wildlife overpass or underpass to be put here, especially with federal highway systems and federal work, we all know it can go kind of slow. Um, I would hope that this would be enough, but I also completely understand that uh, there's kind of data missing, at least in that public land section across from the east end of the property. So I'd hope that someone would continue on with this project and I might have a prospective uh, first year MEM student continuing it on. And I would love to see more trail cameras on the public lands across from the east end of the property, as well as I only did the survey one, two, three of roadkill for about kind of three weeks in, I wanna say like March. And I've seen with the records of some of the wildlife vehicle collision reports that they get a lot more collisions in June and July. So I think it'd be really interesting to get an entire year of data of those wildlife vehicle collisions where they're at, create that heat map and that hot spots again. Because I think, especially here, we get a lot of tourists in, in the summer. So you get a lot more people moving along those roads and a lot more deer and elk hit, especially during the migration season. So much, Anna. That was great. Now I think we can bring the panel up for questions for the group. Yes, I mean. So the question is, is our backgrounds are kind of similar but different to what our projects involve and kind of how these projects are shaping what we're doing in the future. And I'm lucky enough that I'm currently working with Colorado Parks and Wildlife as their ungulate survival crew leader, their migration corridor crew leader, and I'm a member of their mountain lion collaring project. So this past winter I was doing a lot of mountain lion collaring and deer mortality investigations. And I'm actually lucky enough to continue on with them and I will continue to do that work and also bring in some bighorn sheep collaring experience. I'm very excited and kind of watch their migration and moving around. Um, I think I spent too much time outside maybe because now that's kind of all I want to do. And uh, so I think I'm switching gears. 
Yeah, as Eileen mentioned, I'm currently working for a solar company out in St. Louis, which has, you know, it's conservation related kind of, but has nothing to do with pollinators, obviously. Um, I think this project for me has been a passion project. It's something that I love and I got into bees kind of randomly. Before that, I was interested in marine biology and, you know, now I'm working in solar. I think my overarching love is conservation and care for the environment, which I'm sure a lot of people in here can resonate with. Um, I think the pollinator research has been one aspect of that and something I'd love to continue, but it's not my only love. Um, so I think, you know, it's a potential venue, but it's not the only one. I think I'm kind of wide open in terms of what I go into next or how I pursue conservation moving forward. Yeah. Yeah, for people on Zoom, um, the comment was, there's a lot of intersectionality between solar and pollinators, and there is. I'm actually, with my current company, we're having conversations about it right now. Yeah, Pete? Yeah, so Pete's question was in the natural areas I was studying, how their plant diversity compares to like across West Virginia as a whole. Um, so honestly, that's a tough question. I don't know a ton about the larger diversity in West Virginia. I will say in terms of the natural areas that I was studying, um, there was a surprising mix of, you know, some of the plants were native. There were a lot of European species kind of mixed in. I had some invasives like autumn olive. Um, and I'd say that's pretty standard in that area. There's lots of invasives like the autumn olive, the honeysuckle um, that are, you know, taking up more area than they probably should. Yeah, Melanie. Yeah, so Melanie's question, um, she was noting that all of us had science communication built into our projects and was wondering what kind of strategies were effective for us and what we communicate um, to other people that are looking to do the same thing, working with sh shareholders. So I think um, for my project, it was very, you know, I was working with homeowners directly. Um, and so honestly, a lot of my conversations and communication were pretty informal, which I think was actually really beneficial because Particularly, I think people that don't know a lot about a subject that you're talking about. So I'm like, oh, I know all this stuff about bees. Like if you start throwing information at people, it kind of just goes over people's heads, not because they can't handle it, but because it's way too much at once. Um, so I think that relationship building and having those personal relationships to then go, oh yeah, those honeybees that you want to keep in your backyard, they're actually not native to here. Like it's not really conservation, right? Or um, yeah, like that plant species that you have, like that one's really great and that one's not so much, right? So having those relationships first helps make the information a lot more palatable um, and it makes the work a lot more enjoyable as well, I think. Um, I'll start by giving a shout out to Molly Murphy's creative nonfiction writing class because that is a great course for translating science and anything technical and just learning how to make it more creative and interesting. Um, that class is really cool. I would say with the with wild at heart um writing plant ids was really interesting because we broke it it'd be like two paragraphs and the first paragraph is super technical all of the like specifics about how to identify the plant and then the second paragraph would be like something a lot more creative and like fun flowing of just like how like what the plant is like and maybe like something cool about its history and something great about the way it smells or something like that. And so it was really 
an interesting um, way, like experience to kind of make it super technical. And then with that exact same thing, make it super applicable. So. I think a lot of it too is just meeting people where they are because everyone has a different opinion. And I think it was kind of easier in my project in the sense that over half of you raised your hands if you've ever hit an animal while driving. And it's, so it's a very common experience, or at least we know someone who has gotten into a wildlife vehicle collision. And so I think a lot of it is also just allowing people to ask you questions instead of you just telling a lot of people information. It's allowing them to come to you and pick your brain because they might know certain things and not know others. And you just don't know where they are. Thank you to this panel. Great job. I think the word that's resonating in my mind right now is smart. Aren't these women smart? Doing great work up here. I was looking on the ahead on the schedule and we, we, we do have some male voices coming in in our next panel, but what an amazing morning of smart women sharing their work. So thank you for representing us so well. And now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage, they're on the stage, but I'm going to now uh, introduce our newest Master of Science and Ecology student, Hunter Benkowski. Congratulations. Master in Environmental Management, Ashley Peterson. And Master in Environmental Management, Anna Markey. Congratulations to you all. I hope you guys enjoy us after the break and stick around to listen to the future stewards of America from the superb Sam Archibald, the marvelous Matthew Merritt, and the wonderful Whitney Stewart.